All right, one of the things we like to do at Soma Asheville is we like to talk a little bit. So we want to, I just want to take a couple minutes to process some of this, just some thoughts, encouragements, maybe questions, um, ways you maybe are understanding um, the gospel in a way that maybe you're like, okay, that, that was helpful. Anything come to mind? Don't be shy. If nobody has a question, I'm going to say something. Say something. Well, no, it's a question. <laughs> you know, some, some, it just in my walk with Christ, there have been times that have been frustrating, and I thought, you know, God, why did you make us where we can sin? Mm-hmm. You know, you've had that choice. You could have made us where we And I've gone down, you know, and then we wouldn't have free will, and, you know, we made the decision to rebel. But you said something today that God created us. You know, we were created from him in his image. Mm-hmm. I've always been told or taught that God can't be bad. God can't be evil. He can't do bad things. And I, so I guess, you know, the, the question came to my mind, well, if we can, how, did, how, how does that work? Does that make any sense? I think so. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, some of um, <clears throat> some of the, there is a bit of a mystery to God's plan. Like, you could have wrote, wrote you could have wrote the script any way you wanted to, and yet this is this is this is reality. This is life. This is the world. And you know, I think um, I actually talked with Aaron quite a bit about some of these exact questions and this um, just this evil plan that was sown into creation. And there was a there was a tree. And um, this rebel. This, when we go through the story of God, <clears throat> we talk about this perfect expression of life, and and um, yeah, and so you know the rebellion that Satan brought to the earth, they're cast down, and then we buy into the rebellion. We buy into it. Adam and Eve said, well, "We're going to believe that," and. Um, so yeah, it, it, it um it's maddening sometimes to have to live life as broken, sinful, in process humans. Um I think uh hopefully we're all experiencing um the lie I think sometimes we believe is that the love of God's not big enough, the grace of God's not deep enough. And I know that um um we have we have experienced just the depths of his love and the kind of his kindness, and it's still maddening when I'm deceived, and you're deceived, and we're all deceived, and we and that happens to all of us, not just Valerie. It's all of us still buy in daily, sometimes weekly, and I think we're learning, and we live we live in a country where a lot of the the resources and the power to change have been lost to therapy and psychology and. We we haven't recovered the the potency of this message, and so um, I don't know if that's helpful. But I wouldn't call it good, yeah, but yeah, but I think I think when God redeems, like when God redeems us, He changes the narrative. To you thought it was bad, but I've redeemed it and I've made it beautiful. And what you thought was worthless, I've made worthy. And what you thought was awful, I'm putting new meaning into it. You don't have to be careful to say, so do we sin more that grace may abound more? God yeah. Did. Yeah. So, um, is that helpful? Or? And of course, the, you know, the overarching principle or, or reality <clears throat> is that it's all working out for His glory. Mm-hmm. You know, Yeah. But it, it all does fit within the 
context of God revealing himself mm -hmm. and, and glorifying himself. That is ultimately what it does. Yeah. yeah. And it's all in the way you look at it, too. I mean, we're not, we're not big enough or powerful enough to mess up God's plan. So <clears throat> there's pride involved in thinking that, but although there's a lot of bondage in thinking that as well, thinking mm -hmm. I'm going to screw everything up, you cannot. You know, God is sovereign. Um, but you know we're not we're not freed to sin we're freed from sin and a lot of people get that wrong a lot of people throw off you know they they go about grace the wrong way and they say well now I can do whatever I want but you're not free to sin you're free from sin mm -hmm. if, you know if that makes any sense yep. um, God's <coughs> sovereignty rules over all so there's great assurance in the fact that He's rescued you from sin so that when you do fall, when you do stumble and fall, you're not going to throw off humanity mm -hmm. <laughs> by what you've done. He will rescue and he will save. Um, but it, but it's not a freedom, again, it's not a freedom to sin, it's a freedom from sin. You're free from that burden. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, the burden. I think as Christians, does anybody else in here as a Christian still struggle with sin? Everybody better raise your hand. So the miracle is the next time you sin in your heart or you sin against your spouse or your kids, the miracle of the gospel is you're no longer defined by it. Now, you still maybe have guilt. You may be tempted with shame. You may be tempted to be defined by it. But when you start to translate, you mean I'm not condemned right now? Well, the world condemns me. Everything about my existence would condemn me. And it's not that it's, no, it doesn't matter. It does matter. It required the slaughter of the Son of God. So when we sin again, and when we start to see this doesn't define me, you start to feel a freedom. Like, I don't have to atone for my sin. I don't have to make my wife a, a special dinner because I hurt her yesterday, which is what we kind of do. Huh? <laughs> that may be my response to repentance, but not to... Yeah, that's right. She probably would. Does that make sense? So I think sometimes as Christians, um, we can end up living very guilt-ridden, con condemning, heavy lives because we still sin. That's what we're going to get to in the second session. How does this begin to take possession of us so that we actually, even when we... I'm learning when I sin to not to atone. You mean the cross is still sufficient? For me, now, 20 years in the road, I'm still doing... Let me raise my hands. God, that's good news. Still sufficient for struggling sinners. And that releases the guilt, the pressure, the um, I got to get my crap together real fast. I can actually rest in the finished work of Christ today. And, and, and our churches and our people say, you got to get it together. You got a timeline. Jesus will say 70 times 70. 70 times 7. Say we're going to continue to work this thing out. So it does, um, the, the weight starts to come off when we realize the cross is, says it's not defining, it doesn't define us. It's good news. I think the crazy thing, too, is that God's even revealed to us in this room the, the nature of this conversation. <coughs> like the question she asked, is a, it's a huge, complicated question that 99% mm. of the world's not asking. Mm. And while we don't have all the answers, but by God's grace, He's even allowed us to be part of this conversation. Not just allow us to be part of the conversation, but allow us to sit at this table with grace for eternity. Mm -hmm. So some of the questions are... That's great. That's a long, hard question. Yeah. I don't know if you could answer it in a couple of seconds or minutes. Yeah. Any, anybody else just on the morning questions? Yeah. Um, and knowing people that I've had some interactions with, even, you know, talking with about the gospel and seeing that they're kind of stuck in that same mindset, uh, 
you know, what's the kind of the feel of knocking that perspective change, that paradigm shift in your mind, looking at the gospel that way and, and, and coming at it with, from that angle as opposed to the way that the American church seems to still be it? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things I think would be one is leadership. I think a lot of churches and, and what, what's being, how churches are being led is maybe a, a thing to think about. Like, in, you know, we can't always control that, but a lot of just what they've grown up teaching and propagating and building around is a bit deficient. I think we're going to talk about in this session repentance a lot, and I think the way to get new sight and the way to get new change in your life is going to be through this thing called repentance, and it's ongoing. It's not just a one-time thing at the cross 20 years ago. It's a new way of life. I mean, we're learning about that in our DNA groups. How do you begin to live this ongoing life of repentance? Because I'm free now to say what's real. So I'm free to confess and let Jesus keep replacing and substituting. And I think some of the churches are saying, like, we've repented at, when I was 7 or when I was 9 or 15. Or I grew up in this, but then I've been told really to work really hard, do a bunch of religious stuff, and therefore somehow there'd be a, a magic moment. And the magic moment never comes. What's wrong with me? And sometimes I think it's um, we end up building religious resumes to replace the work of Christ. And so, um, I don't know. I think we're, we're so much was learning how to get off of the religious Jesus and let um, this thing start to speak anew, you know, into, into us. So, I don't know. Any other thoughts on Trey's questions from you guys? Mm. And the Lord has always been extremely faithful and steadfast to knock me off my high horse. And and I think for people who are truly after the Lord, I think the Lord is going to bring them back to that. And, and He's going to knock you down in His wonderful grace. But it's been a lifetime of, um, of forgetting the, the rules and, and trying to be honest. You know, what, what Tommy said a lot about just being honest with who you really are. Um, you know, but, but my pride has been knocked down quite brutally several times in my life. And I think the Lord will do that for you. I mean, for those people who are there. <clears throat> Trey has a similar story. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I know the Holy Spirit's going to take responsibility for it, but, you know, I think that, and again, I'll probably just see it play out over time. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, we didn't get to the Luke 15 paradigm on your sheet, but I'll just plug Tim Keller's book, Prodigal God. Who's, who's read that? What is it? Prodigal God. Will you grab Valerie's Prodigal God? Right there. So we didn't do the Luke 15 paradigm, but one of the things, one of the deceptions in the South is religion equals gospel. Right? So they're doing all this religious stuff. They think their own gospel, their own religion. They're the elder brother. They're the Pharisee. But yet they think they're on Jesus. And it's very deceptive in the South. So when you start preaching the gospel, people, you automatically think younger brother. And I think, you know, it's, it's just an exposition on Luke 15. It's nothing like, you're reading it like, oh, of course, this is right there in the text. But one of the challenges in the South is how do we preach the gospel not just for that younger brother? How do we preach the gospel for the elder brother? And what we find, I didn't, you know, Brian and I grew up in crazy past, but if you did grow up in the church, you probably have that elder brother gene somewhere in your gift, in your mix. And part of Christ shattering that um, I mean, you think about the disciples' journey. It was largely failure. Largely failure. But if you always insulate from failure, if you always keep doing the stuff, you'll never get to Jesus. 
and you'll never change. And the pressure and the performing and the pretending just continues until it shatters one day because God loves you. Not because He's condemning you. He loves you. He wants to give you a better life. So we didn't get to that. But this is, a, this is probably what I would say. Just read this like five times. And then we, we do it a lot, don't we? Mike's got a big, big story on this, right? So again, a lot of gospel ministry can happen as you start to look at um, cultures. Entire cultures are elder brotherly. King sports and elder brother culture. What's Asheville? Younger brother culture. How you would preach the gospel to King sports is very different from how you preach the gospel from Asheville because it's a totally different context. Even when you're within your own household, you got elder brother, younger brother, probably in your marriages. Probably have, you will definitely have it in your kids. We have some elder brothers in our house. We have some younger brothers in our house. How you parent them, how you preach them, totally different. So, I mean, in the South, you've got to deal with that reality. In Nashville, you've got to preach to both cultures. In Kingsport, it's more monoethnic, like elder brother. So, I mean, you have to help them. You have to convince them their good deeds are getting in the way of Jesus. All your good stuff is getting in the way, repenting of your good stuff. You haven't been sleeping around and going to getting drunk and meth, and you've been doing a bunch of good stuff, so you don't have a need for a savior. And you have to repent of that. That's hard, and that can be harder. Jeff and I are new to the South uh, about a year and a half. We were exactly what you're talking about. And okay. I think, you know, with the older brother and all that, and, and something that comes to my mind is, is a cure for that is to read your Bible yourself. Don't, don't depend on what your preacher is giving you on Sunday mornings. You know, we have to be like the Bereans and say, okay, is that the right thing? Is that what it really says? Is that what yeah. it means? <clears throat> you know, and, and we need to be, a lot of people that I come across where I live, you know, they say they're Christian, but they don't act that way. Well, do they really know what's in here? Have mm-hmm. they read it in the last month, in the last week, in the last day? And you know, Are what? they really yeah. following that? And, and I would say that that would be a way, this gentleman on the other side over there, you know, be in the scripture and know inside, outside, upside down what Christ said. <clears throat> because... A lot of what our churches, what what we are, what we did experience, um, you know, searching for a church home was they made a lot of extra stuff on the people that's not scriptural that yeah. would that would turn Jesus' stomach and he would have a lot to say to those people because it's not. <coughs> and I think that's a key. Um, Tell you what, let's go ahead. Tell you what, let's let's do Luke 15. Thank you, Valerie. See how the Spirit used you? Thank you for raising your question. But let's just go ahead and let's do the exercise together. Let's go to Luke chapter 15. And we're going to just take a quick look. This is, um, <clears throat> in many ways, the heartbeat. If you're looking for a heartbeat in the entire Bible, Luke 15 is the way it, it captures the heart. So, and so we're going to kind of take a fresh look together at the situation... Um, story of the prodigal sons, and as we'll find out, there's actually two lost sons, not one. And the word prodigal means recklessly extravagant, and the whole premise of the book was God becomes a prodigal to reach prodigals. He sacrifices everything. He will lose everything to recapture that which was lost and far away. And that's the, that's the extravagant love of the Father that would want to do that. Let's read, uh, somebody read uh, chapter 15. <clears throat> Let's do 1 through 3. Who wants to do 1 through 3? Hang on, hang on, I'm sorry. 
You got one through three. Thank you. Who's the next section? 11 through, Kylie, 11 through uh, 24, 25 to 32. Brian, okay, thank you. Go. One through three? One through three. Okay, so make a quick note. We have two people in the crowd. Who are the crowd? Who's the two kinds of people? Okay, and what's the grumbling about? Okay, Jesus is Jesus is behaving. He's doing things that we don't we don't do that. He doesn't know what's going on. So they're grumbling, and they're, is it saying their hearts? They're grumbling. We're going to see it's a lot of inner stuff. They're, all these opinions on the inside. Okay. So Jesus tells a story of a, of a lost sheep. He tells a story of a lost coin. And then he goes to a story of, a, of sons. Kylie. 11 to where? 11 to 24. couple quick notes. <clears throat> so the, this younger son basically says, uh, Father, I wish you were dead. I don't want you. I want your stuff. Give me, give me my inheritance. <clears throat> the father graciously agrees. The younger son goes away. And what does he squander it on? Wild living. Wild living. He goes to find himself. He goes to explore life and experience all that life has to provide. And he begins to realize... Um, It's not what I thought. I'm not getting the life I thought I would give. Parties, celebration, and yet he's finding in all the parties and all the celebration, there's no celebration, there's no party in here. And he's empty. And he says, I'm going to go home. I'm going to go home. So what does he start doing? How's he going to go home? What's he going to do? Maybe a resume. Let me start cooking up a story. I'm going to now perform. I'm going to give a good, good, good explanation. I'm going to justify or I'm going to admit. And we find the father waiting for him. He's waiting. He's looking. And he sees him coming. And what's he do? He runs to him. Humiliates himself. Exposes him. Runs. Embraces his son. Kisses his son. Well, son, but dad, no, no, no. Come on in. You see the love of the father transform this wayward son. And what's the father's response? Man, we need to have a party. This is a town-wide party. Let's celebrate. Let's kill the fattened calf. He, his father gets the heart of his son, so he doesn't have to give the reasons. He wants to be a slave. What's the son say? What's the father say? Store you to status, robe. You have the full rights, still have the full rights as a son. Okay? Extravagant. 
Hardy, um, fat and calf. He got a better celebration with his father, didn't he? He got to celebrate by being in relationship. You don't have to go away from the father to get, get celebrate. You get relationship. You get you get relationship and celebration together. This is amazing. Let's go to the next son, twenty five to uh, thirty two. summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. His father came out and began to <coughs> him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I've been serving you, and I've never neglected a command of yours, and yet you've never given me a young goat, so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came... Who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes? You killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we have to celebrate and rejoice, for this brother of yours is dead, and has begun to live, and was lost, and has been found. Okay, tell me a little bit about the older brother. What do you notice about him? Okay, how, how, where did, and Kylie, where do you see that in the text? Okay, do you guys hear that? Google now. I didn't ask you about it. <clears throat> okay, so he's always been close to the father his whole life. Um, he doesn't think he's ever disobeyed, so that gives you a little tip off on how he's evaluating obedience. Um, what did you just say? He's what? So although he's been around the household his whole life, he's confused about what being a son means. There's some confusion. And what, what, what do his sins look like? What do you see here? What happens to him? The, the, the presence of the younger brother's sinner exposes something dormant in the older brother. What, what gets exposed? Angry. He's angry. What else? Jealous. jealous over the party. He's anger, jealous, he's condescending on his younger brother. The son of yours? Not my brother, son of yours. What else? He feels deserving. He, he, feels, he feels, the younger brother doesn't feel worthy. He, I've earned it. Entitled. I'm entitled. You, you have to do this for me. They're both trying to get things from the father, but they're trying to get them different ways. One just gives him the finger. One quietly serves, same motivation. <laughs> kind of has this idea. I get it that of you know, what? That's a great point. Well, that there's not like there's not enough to go around. Like he's in competition because there's you know he he's not going to get what he thinks is coming to him because it's it's going to run out or something. I mean that's just yeah. what I get. Yeah. Okay. I like the word you just said. Competition. Yeah. He's he's comparing, and maybe this isn't fair. So he's very much of a fair justice kind of kid. We got one of those in our house. Yeah, good. So let's, let's put some things up here. So I'm going to put here, they're both, uh, we said works righteousness. Let's go in. They're, both, they're both sons, they're both lost, they're both operating under this premise. <coughs> under the Father. Let's, uh, let's do a little chart of um, uh, younger brother. And the elder brother. Okay, <clears throat> so um, going, Jesus is telling a story. So, in context, going back to verses one through three, who would be the younger brother? Okay, good sinners. <coughs> okay, elder brother. OK? 
Okay? Let's, let's keep comparing. What, what do we notice about these two? What, what does the younger brother's sin look like? Carnal, outward, in your face. What about the sins of the Pharisee? Okay, so there's outward. There's outward. Let me put here. There's outward, uh, inward. So inward. So I'm gonna put here um, outward sins. And I'm going to put here, um, they're doing the good, you said motivations. They're doing good deeds, but out of the wrong motivation. There's an outward compliance. There's a um, compliance. The older brother's compliant. We will. Well, don't, you, well, you, get the, you get the right answer then. You just... Uh, Let's see, see how this group does and get into our, what our DNA did. So, we'll, uh, so we got compliance and we got rebellious. What else? Mike, you can, you can go off the sheet. Well, the younger brother eventually repents, right? He turns and realizes that things are okay in Brad's place any after all. Okay, that maybe tells us something about... What about the young, elder brother in the story? We're just going to put, we don't really know, but in the story, he, at least the way the story lives, he's, is he in the party? He hasn't yet come into the party. No, the party offered to him. He's still outside. I'm, I'm not sure yet if I'm going to go in. I think it's safe to say if it's the kind of father that we think he is, all that I have is yours. Of course you're invited. What, you're, yeah, absolutely. What else about these two brothers? I'm going to put tolerant. One's judgmental, one has uh, rules, one's tolerant. Good. He's uh, open-minded. We, gotta, we need more open-mindedness. You have rules about everything. Yeah, what else? What else do you see about these two? Okay. Yeah, I'm not going to... Yeah, that's true. Yeah, they, they both were after the same things. They both were wanting from the Father. They were wanting to get from the Father, but they didn't want the Father. They, they went about it different ways. So that's a common thread in their self-righteousness. They both are after, give me what's mine. I'm not, I'm not after you, I'm after your stuff. Yeah, to, to contrast them. What else? Mike, give us a couple off that list. Okay, so your younger brother is your irreligious person. He did not grow up in church. This guy's religious. He knows the rules. He knows the expectations. He knows how to, he knows how to go into this environment and do and say this and looks a certain way. Um, Yeah. I don't have any part here, so I'm just I'm getting out of town. Yeah. You know? What we're going to find is that the rebellion of the younger brother, love would have gone after the brother. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go get I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna go get my brother. 
and bring him back. Right? And we're going to really, the way the, I think where the story ends is that we find there's, there is an older brother that comes for the other brother. Jesus came for us. He left the Father. He went and got us, brought us back to the Father. So, so that, that, that brother exists. This brother feels justified to not go. Maybe, yeah. And so not, not at great cost to him, at risk to him, because this is fair. He doesn't deserve it. He guess he's getting what he deserves. We got that kind of thinking in the church? So there's no, um, yeah. I'm going to put some political things. Is the younger brother a Democrat or a Republican? Let's get personal. A lot of your Democrats, I think, would be more here. Like, we just got to, like, be more tolerant, open. A lot of your Republicans. We could put Asheville's up here. Asheville's here. Right? Right at, right? Some Asheville people. This is total culture built around younger brother stuff. This, this is probably Kingsport. This is a lot of Kingsport thinking right here. Madison County. <clears throat> so, yeah. Um, a couple of the things I have here. Elder brother, conformity and tradition. Younger brother, non-conventional, non-conformed. Elder brother says, I have no need for redemption. I haven't done anything wrong. I haven't done anything wrong. I've kept, I've kept everything. Younger brother says, I can't be redeemed. It's too bad. That doesn't exist for me. Um, we mentioned repentance. Repent of your good deeds. Repent of your, your outward sins. One believes in... What else? Um, that gets it. Moralism and legalism. Licentious living. You see that? So, um, you know, a lot of my testimony... So you, you can be one or the other. You can flip-flop. I was a younger brother. I was raised by hippies. I grew up like this, had a conversion to Jesus in college, and I got slowly discipled in elder brother religion. And I didn't fit. I couldn't do all the good stuff. I was a big sinner. I struggled with sin. I had lust in my heart. I, I partied a bunch. I couldn't play by these rules. So guess how, guess how a lot of my early church experience was? God, I'm all, this is just bad. I'm a bad person. I knew I was a bad person, but I can't play these games. And, and that's, again, part of it. I mean, I was growing and changing and becoming. And then in 2005 and six, I had this major crisis in my fifth year of seminary where I realized I can't do it anymore. I'm doing the studies and I'm memorizing hundreds of scriptures and I'm exegeting papers and I'm not changing. And God gave me one of those stories and it was a big retooling of getting me off of more of maybe elder brotherish tendencies and slowly moving my life back onto the gospel. Now, then try to start leading families in that, leading a church in that very imperfectly, maybe leading a church plant in that, maybe a little better. So a lot of my own story was um, <clears throat> some of this. Um, so you'll have this even temperamentally. Think about your kids. Some of your kids are going to be very much wired this way. They're just, they're just going to come out of the womb. They're going to be more of your free-spirited, um, push the boundaries. Which one of my kids is like this? I think I have two like this, actually. Well, I think, well, I think Ellis is younger brother, but, but he, he's kind of a selective elder brother. He's, he's elder brother on what he wants to be elder brother. But he's, I think, who's our, who's our compliant, follow the rules kid? Always looks like he's doing everything he's supposed to be doing. Silas. Silas going to be here. Okay? So you have this in cultures. You have this in families, in your own marriage. You'll have some of this. Okay? Um, now here's the thing. Tell me about the younger brother. What does he think is wrong with the world? He looks at the world through his elder brother, younger brother lens, and he thinks everything wrong with the world is these people. And if all these people would be like us, now we would get along better. What does the elder brother think? 
Everything that's wrong with that world is these people. And if they would get their crap together and perform and be like us, then the world would work. It's like Mary and Martha all over again. Yeah. Now, what Jesus is going to say is both of these are wrong. The answer is neither. So, neither of these is the way. There's another way. It's called, and it's called Him. It's called the Gospel. Where you can have absolute beliefs and have, it, and have extravagant love. You can be confident and humble. You can be full of grace and full of truth. And it's not a mixture and it's not in the middle compromise. It's, 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 it's two ceasing to exist and forming one new. Right? If you're going to preach the gospel to this elder brother, how would we want to preach to him? How would you, or her, how would you want to preach the gospel to an elder brother? Good news. What would be good news for this elder brother? That he doesn't have to try and add up. He doesn't have to try and be good enough. Yeah. You're already good enough. Jesus performed for you. You'll never accomplish enough to warrant his love. And if you're earning his love, if you're working hard for the approval of the Father, the good news is you already have the approval of the Father because of what the Son did for you. And you're striving for perfection. You're striving to be perfect. Striving to measure up to the law. He did it perfectly. He never, he never disobeyed one time. And when you realize He was crucified for that, at your expense, at, at your hand, and yet in that rebellious act, He would offer you His new life, that starts to transform Everything about how you thought the world worked. And you start to feel something you never felt before. Love. What about the younger brother? No matter what he's done, forgive. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. It's like the same thing, really. No matter what they've done, they've, you know, whether what you've done or what you haven't done. Yeah. Like for, the, for the older brother, the word rest is what comes to mind for me. You know, it's like, mm. rest. Mm. From, from all of these things you're trying to do. Yeah. Because God has done it. Because Jesus accomplished it. You rest. And the younger brother, what struck me is like he was in this place with pigs where he was completely without value. There was no one who would feed him. And when he went home to his father, he was not a different person. But in his father, he had value. Mm-hmm. So, um, it wasn't anything different in the younger brother in what he had achieved. It was, it was, it was finding significance in his fault. Yeah. Yeah, this person has value. Man, I've, I've, God hates me. God, my father hates me. I've disqualified myself from the love of God. I'll never amount to anything. I've, the world thinks I'm worthless. I've screwed up too bad, too many divorces, too many bankruptcies. I've, I've cheated, I've embezzled, I've been in prison. Char, you know, Colson went to prison. I'm talking about Chuck Colson at the break. And yet, um, it's like the father saying, well, now I can finally work with you. Now you finally know who we always knew you were. And the same for this one. Now, in the story at least, this one, who, which one has a harder time coming to the father? In the story. Older brother. Because I'm deserving. I've logged all these years with you. What are you, are you saying? And so sometimes, um, you know, my wife has very much of this story. If you know my wife's story. She grew up in the church and struggled with assurance of salvation. And she would tell you, like, um, God had to bring her slowly out of this. I was coming from the other direction. You know, and that's very much of us relearning what it means to believe in what Jesus did for us. Yeah. Tertullian said, Just as Christ was crucified between two thieves, <clears throat> church historian, this doctrine of justification was crucified between two opposite errors. Legalism, 
and license, absolutism and relativism, religion and irreligion. Legalism is a self-salvation project through conformity to rules, standards. It doesn't have to be religious. So what we're learning is like, just because maybe in Nashville there's not... Um, they both have lists of what they think... They both have a standard that they think will measure life by. The elder brother just has a religious standard. So it's in the name of God. Younger brothers have standards too. It's just a different standard. So they're both trying to evaluate and achieve salvation or righteousness just through a different way. And so, um, license the self-salvation project through casting off shackles of tradition, conformity for a life of self-discovery, self-actualization. So, um, we've overlaid this onto some cultures. Um, we have a lot of engineers in the room. Which one of these would be an engineering culture? Yeah. What would be an artistic culture? Younger brother. So they both have different sets of idols. So how are you going to preach Jesus to them? Good news, totally different. Because the idols are different. You're living for this and you're living for this. How do we get you to Jesus so you don't stumble by those cultures? I think they're both rugged American individualists as well. Probably. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anything else on this? Yeah. Um, I just want to say how, how beautiful it is uh, to see um, the way you live in the gospel and how, mm. how it's uh, some here um, in the smoke, uh, come from a liberal background, some conservative, and, and you see it, there's nothing in here that's conservative or liberal. It's all we come together. It's how we come together and and it's, it's beautiful to see how God uses where we came from. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're, liberal and conservative. we're liberal and conservative for a reason, because that way we can reach out to the, to our group and show them, look, this isn't what your identity should be in. It mm-hmm. should be in Christ, and we show them uh, identity in the gospel. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's, it's just beautiful. I don't know if I've ever been in a church where, where they're just, I, I just, I mean, and I'm very attuned to it. I can't see any conservatism or liberalism in what we do here. Hmm. It's all so gospel centered that those things are just they're gone. And it's, hmm. it's just so beautiful to me. Oh, thanks, Mike. You never said that before. You got me crying up here. <laughs> Don't make me cry <clears throat> for all these people. Thank you. We've worked hard to try to not be a conservative church, liberal. Because Jesus, we found Jesus not doing right. And so, yeah, I mean, uh, imagine a church where we can actually be together. We can have unity. How beautiful is that? We think, we think that's what the church is, and we're trying imperfectly, trying to do that. Trying to be a, if you're an elder brother, man, do you have ministry ahead of you? You can start getting clear on the gospel. You know the pressure. You know the, you know the, how condemning and, and, and awful. So how, how can we begin to equip you to be a good news people to, to elder brothers? If you're a younger brother in here, man, there's ministry for you. You know, we need tons of people in Charlotte with that elder brother background, and you want to be able to give them good news. Yeah, he wants to send you. Use your story. Absolutely. More organ from Susan. So, well, this is good. Um, anything else on this, or questions, or just how you're encouraged, or thoughts as we. Um, is that helpful to see? Um, we, have a, we have a chart, <clears throat> religion versus gospel, irreligion versus gospel. And I can send you that PDF if you want of just how to evaluate life. Like Again, it, it translates into like when I'm criticized. What does irreligion say? What does religion say? What would the gospel say when I'm criticized? Or here's my prayer life. Here's my, my identity. So, you know, we've, we've worked through some of that and you know, we, we can send that out to you guys. Help be helpful. So, well, the organ's playing. Um, <clears throat> let's take a break. You think? Let's take a break and um, let's go ahead and uh, we'll do gospel fluency when we get back in the afternoon. Okay, so we don't have to keep strictly. The older brother would say we have to keep strictly to it. We don't have to keep strictly to it. Um, 
I'll say a couple things um, real quick. Um, so we think about lunch, maybe around 1 o'clock, come start easing back. We'll try to maybe get started at 1.15 for the afternoon. Um, the recommendations for food, there's white duck taco, which has already been claimed by this couch, if you want to go with these guys, the white duck taco. The Baja fish is what I get every time. I normally, I normally explore the space, but I do the Baja fish every time at Zia's. So if you like Mexican, there's a good place right next door. There is a Sunny Point, maybe Busy. So if you go there and there's like a 45-minute wait, maybe there's Biscuit Head across the street, which is also a local. What else? Some actual people. What else would be good? Huh? Neo Burrito. Yeah, um, it's off, it's off Haywood Road, go uh, whatever direction that is. If you go down the hill to Patton, there's Bonfire, which is a good pork barbecue. Bonfire's there. So, um, so yeah, we'll, we'll resume back about 1 o'clock, 1.15. Um, I do want to say we, we are a church plant, and we are a uh, poor becoming church plant. So none of this, this is to equip the church. And Celeste and I love this room. We love your families. So no obligation. If you want to donate something, there's a black box back there that we dump money into when we have cash. And so if you want to do that, you can. You don't have to. A lot of you guys are already supporting us, and you're already a part of this. So, um, But just know that's there as well if, if you would like to do a love offering in the back. So that's there. So um, anyway, this has been a good morning. This has been helpful. So this is all foundational stuff. You know, we start to get this stuff in place, and we start to live out of this. It creates new trajectories for life so Jade you want to maybe just pray for us pray for the morning pray over just what we've covered